Uh, welcome you all to the CME today at uh, 8 uh, a.m. Uh, B.M. Sorry, and we'd like you to uh, to thank you for attending our CME uh, today, which is organized by the Dakhliya uh, Primary Healthcare Committee and by the Oman 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 Family Medicine Society. And uh, we welcome we welcome you all, and we hope that we can get like a fruitful uh, uh, activity. Uh, we also would like to give our regards to your activities and the management of, of COVID cases. And you are doing great job, uh, especially in the care. Both of the cases are coming to your side, and uh, hopefully you can get like a good experience and. Uh, uh, as a clinician and as a family also, as a member of your family, you are looking after your family, and also you are coping with stressors, etc. in the COVID-19 era. So our activity will last about uh, 50 minutes, and we have uh, our speaker, Dr. Al-Murtasim Al-Qasabi. Uh, uh, he'll be introduced by our colleague, uh, Al-Walid Al-Mahrouqi, uh, and he'll give you a small summary, I mean, a brief summary and on the CV of Dr. Al-Murtasim. And we have also with us uh, our colleague, Dr. Ahmed Boussaidi, uh, as also co-host on this activity. The activity have uh, different uh, options uh, to interact with us. Uh, you can interact through chatting, uh, if the voice is not good, etc. And uh, our colleagues are looking at your chat. And also you can interact uh, through the Q&As. If you have a question, uh, you can put it on the Q&A uh, in your uh, screen. Uh, we'll try to answer the, your questions uh, either by uh, directly answering through the audio visual or we can answer it as a written uh, towards uh, your uh, reply. In the CME also you'll have like a poll in which uh, Dr. Amatasim will uh, throw some questions uh, through slides and we'd like you to participate actively with us. So you can uh, make the, your answers. Of course, your answer will be uh, uh, unknown. I mean, you will not be identified. And don't feel uh, uh, shy to answer uh, questions. Uh, this will be more interactive. We have like four balls. Uh, please, act I mean, share with us I mean, your answers on the ball activity. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the all are silent, and you can, sh I mean, participate by chatting. Uh, the other issue, I mean, uh, uh, yet we don't have almost the accreditation, but we can send like a certificate for attend attending to the activity after we finish the CME today. Uh, we can send it uh, to your email as a PDF file. Uh, Dr. Walid, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dr. Zahar. Welcome uh, all my brother and my sister uh, to our CME. I will introduce Dr. al Muhtasim al Qassabi, who is a specialist in, the, in, the term, in dermatology program. He graduated from uh, Sultan Qaboos University in 2012. He finished his uh, residency program in dermatology in OMSP in 2017. He was, uh, and he's still very active president and a doctor, and he was best resident in the pathology program for the academic uh, program in 2015-2016. Dr. al Muhtasim he conducted a search about the prevalence and the predictors of depressive symptoms among attendees of tertiary care dermatology clinic in Muscat, in March 2018, and this uh, search was published by International Journal of Dermatology. Now, Dr. Al Muhtasim is working in Bahla Polyclinic since 2017, and he's very active uh, in social media. I recommend all of you to go through his uh, account, and uh, you can ask uh, any question in dermatology, especially from uh, family medicine and general doctors. So, Dr. al Muhtasim, now your uh, turn to start your session. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zahal, and thank you, Dr. Walid, for this warm uh, introduction. Uh, it's, it is my pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to uh, Oman Family Medicine, uh, Family Medicine Society and the Directorate uh, General for Health Services for uh, 
uh, linking this uh, webinar. Uh, my aim in this webinar, inshallah, is to concentrate on the uh, uh, common skin complaints presenting to the primary health care. I, I will give you just small introduction about most of the uh, common uh, presentations. Uh, you, as you know, that uh, skin complaints are very common. Uh, it will take a long time to discuss all of them. I will just discuss the, the common presentations. Uh, please be, be, uh, please uh, be free to ask questions at the end. Uh, and uh, I hope the lecture will benefit to all of you. Shall I start, or Dr. Zahab? You can start, Dr. Murtasim. You can start. I will. I will just stop the video um, to make uh, the internet a little bit faster. So, if you if you couldn't hear me or the voice is not clear to you, just uh, please uh, mention that in the chat on your screen. So. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. So we'll, get, we'll start with doing a small introduction about skin, function of the skin and how to describe a skin lesion. And then we'll discuss about the common skin disorders and common skin complaints in pediatrics and adults. And just before uh, the end, I will, I'll give um, in four slides, we'll discuss about the manifestation of uh, COVID-19. At the end, we'll uh, open the floor for uh, questions and answers. As Dr. Zaha said, you, if you have any question, you just click on Q&A in your screen, and then it will uh, the question will uh, reach us, will come to us, and then we'll uh, maybe we'll answer it by text or we'll answer it by by V. So. When we talk about skin, we talk about the largest uh, body organ. It has three layers, as you know, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Uh, the surface area is about uh, approximately two millimeter uh, two square, and it uh, covers almost 16% uh, of uh, the body weight. And all, uh, as with, uh, with all other organs, skin has many functions. Uh, it is uh, important in protection as it is an uh, anatomic barrier. I think the slide is a little bit slow. I'm just waiting for the slide to come. Okay. Uh, okay, so it is important in protection, it is important in thermoregulation, it is important in storage and synthesis, especially for the synthesis of uh, vitamin D. It's also important in the sweat ex uh, excretion, as and as you know, it is important also in sensation, as we it, it contains a variety of uh, nerve endings, and it's, it's also important in communication. When we talk about skin, clinically, the most important uh, step or information to know is how to describe a skin lesion. And this is actually, it will help you in two ways. It will help you in how to, to communicate the skin findings in your patient. And it, it's also, it helps you in narrowing your differential diagnosis and then finally reaching the diagnosis. So it is at, in the left side, as you, you see, it's important to describe the lesion, the color of the lesion, the shape and configuration, the texture, the size, the location, and the distribution. I know all of you know this. This is just uh, a quick revision. So, and when we talk about the lesions, we have a primary and secondary lesions. The primary lesions represent the early stage of the lesion, and the secondary lesions represent the later stage of the lesion after the evolution of the, the disease or after the يعني, uh, alteration by external factors, like for example, scratch, scratching by the patient. So, when we talk about primary lesions, we talk about macules, papules, patches, plaques, vesicles, pulla, nodule, wheel, and pustules. Now you have the slide. So, uh, on the left side, we have macules and patches. These are the flat skin lesions. Macule is less than one centi, and patch is larger than one centi, as you see in the photo above. 
In the right side, you see babule and black. Uh, black usually is longer than one centi, and babule is less than one centi in size. It's not a strict uh, information that it should be less than one centi. Some literature mention it is, should be uh, less than one uh, point one uh, point uh, centi. So, the other primary lesions, uh, starting from the left side, we have vesicle, which is a fluid-filled lesion, less than one centi. And if it is like, like uh, more than one centi, we call it a bulla. If it is containing uh, a pus, we call it a bull. If it is like this, this lesion and uh, fair, we call it a nodule. And then at the end is a wheel, which is an area of a transient edema. And it is common for, uh, as you know, for urticaria. What about secondary skin lesions? If we start from the left side, I'm just waiting for the slide to come to all of you. Yes, now I think it is available. Okay, so we have crust, the first photo on the left side, which is, uh, which is nothing but a dried fluid and uh, blood, also dead cells. Uh, usually it arises from uh, blocking uh, vesicles or bulla. In the second uh, photo, we have scale, which is ble uh, which the which is the whitish blades, and it, it, it represents the discriminated layers of the stratum corneum. Excoriations, which is abraded skin caused by scratching or rubbing. Erosions, it's due to loss of the epidermis, and fissures, which is a linear cleavage of the skin, which extends very deep. Uh, uh, into the dermis and subcutaneous tissue. The last two uh, secondary complaint, uh, secondary skin lesions. We have atrophy, which is thinning of the epidermis or subcutaneous fat, as you see in the right side photo. And we have liquidifications, with, which is thickening of the epidermis with the exaggeration of the skin lines. And it is very common for uh, patients with atopic dermatitis or chronic uh, dermatitis. So, Dr. Zahar, we have the first question here. If we can uh, uh, put the poll or the question for the whole audience. So, the first question, what is the primary lesion? And the second question, what is your diagnosis? We'll just wait for the whole audience to answer. This is a very simple uh, example. Uh, Dr. Rahmal Kindi, you can answer on the uh, screen. It will appear to your screen. Can You can answer. So we get the percentage. Dr. Saal, you are here. Uh, how many answers we got? We have uh, 72 people uh, answering now. Mm -hmm. We'll wait for the others. We have 96 attendees. Yeah, now 78. It is a very easy question. I know all of you will get it. I think we are stuck on the seven. Uh, now we got 80 people answering. 81. Okay, we can answer the, the result. So, 90% uh, of you got it right. The vesicle here. And also, 86% uh, of you got it also very uh, right. The diagnosis is first up. As you see, the primary lesion here is a, a vesicle. You can close the. Is that
As you see here, the primary lesion is the physical, the, the configuration of the lesions are grouped, uh, grouped vesicles, and uh, they are following a dermatomal uh, distribution. As you see, it is affecting one dermatome in the chest, and there is uh, in, uh, background of erythema. This is typical presentation of uh, herpestocytes. So, we'll start our presentation uh, about the common complaints. I would like to start with uh, birth marks and neonatal dermatosis. I'm guessing for the slide will come to a few. A little bit very slow. Yes, it is there. So when we talk about neonatal dermatosis, almost 90% of them need the assurance. We have few, few dermatoses that need further review by uh, a specialist. It is a huge topic, and I usually give it in one lecture to a resident, but I summarize it here on, on two, three to four slides. So the first photo on the left, you see a patch of erythema, right erythema on the back of the scalp. We call it a salmon batch. It, it is a capillary vascular malformation that usually disappears in infancy. It also can appear on the, in the forehead between both eyes. So this is the typical presentation in the forehead or in the back of the nape of the neck. It doesn't need any um, intervention. Usually the mother will come to you saying that when he cries, the lesion will become dark and more dirty but you can only assure them as, as most of them disappear in, uh, in infancy. The other lesion is very common. Uh, it is a, a bluish gray uh, pigmentation over the sacral area uh, called Mongolian spot. Usually it fades in the first or second year of life. Uh, almost uh, like uh, approximately 3% of patients, they will, they will have it into uh, uh, adult life. Another uh, very common uh, claim is cutis marmorata. Uh, it's due either to cold or due to rubbing of the child or kampum, uh, usually it improves with uh, rewarming. If it's like persistent and you see there is ulceration, uh, it doesn't improve with the rewarming, there is no rub, uh, there's no tight cloth then you should, we should think of another uh, differential and you should refer the patient to a dermatology clinic. Uh, another very common in the last photo, uh, which is a amelia, a superficial uh, keratin cyst, and it, it resolves in a few weeks and you, you don't need to do any uh, uh, intervention. The second slide, I'm just getting it to appear to all of you. A bit slow. Yes. Okay, we have this also one complaint. You notice some uh, uh, hair loss in the uh, occipital scalp of uh, of uh, most of the units. Before it was uh, thought that it is because of the friction or uh, continuous lying, uh, continuous sweeping on the on the occipital scalp by the new net. But now it is considered after uh, uh, like uh, cohort studies, it is more of a physiological hair shedding. It will improve within a few weeks. Another very common uh, complaint, uh, a group small, tiny, uh, whitish papules over the nose. Uh, it is, we call it sebaceous hyperplasia. Sometimes it may look like Sometimes it may look like media, but the species hyperplasia usually is, yeah, has more numerous uh, babules and it is a little bit uh, smaller in size. And it is most likely, most commonly uh, affecting the nose. So it is uh, thought to be to influence the maternal endogenes and usually also in a few months. The next two photos are the things that need to be seen by a specialist. So we have here a dermatomally distributed patch of erythema on the face. 
we call it a port wine stain. It is a capillary vascular malformation. This uh, such patient needs further follow uh, further investigations and needs further also treatment with uh, a vascular laser like BDL laser. Another another very common uh, complaint is uh, hemangioma. As you know, it is a benign vascular uh, neoplasm. Uh, we need to evaluate this patient if he has multiple uh, multiple uh, hemangiomas over the body. We have to evaluate for internal hemangiomas. If he has uh, also uh, hemangioma over the face, uh, we have to evaluate for other symptoms like face syndrome. And we also treat the patient. Usually now we are giving we should refer the patient like as early as possible, and we are like treating with oral propanolol. Okay, now for question uh, two, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Doctor Zahal, I uh, guess waiting for the slide to come. Yes, now it's there. Oh, you have this uh, four-month baby who is coming with diarrhea uh, this day of life. What is your diagnosis? And how will you approach? What is your initial treatment for the patient? I know also this is very, uh, very common complaint, and it's, it is also I know it is uh, very easy to know the answer. Dr. Zohar, how many answers we have now? Now we're getting 75, 78, 80 answers. So getting more, 81. Okay, for the, for the sake of time, we can share the result. Okay. Because now we almost on uh, half an hour. So most of you got it right, 74%. It is irritant contact dermatitis because you see erosions and you see uh, the erythema on the convex surface of the diabal area. And we will discuss why it is not uh, candidate label of dermatitis, uh, dermatitis in a few seconds. And what is the initial treatment? You got it also, most of you got it right, proper diapering and periagnosis. So we'll discuss about, uh, you can close the poll result. So we can, we'll discuss about diabetes rush. It is very common complaint to the primary health care. Uh, we get a lot of unnecessary refers to the dermatology clinic. So it is a of skin condition that can occur in the diabetes area. Why did it occur the, the most commonly the irritant uh, contact dermatitis? Because of local disruption of the skin barrier. So we have ex excessive moisture, we have friction, we have a high enzymatic activity of the like urine. And we have increased uh, BH in the diaper area. This is all the, uh, contributing to the appearance of diaper rash. So, what is the differential diagnosis of diaper rash? 80% uh, of the cases is due to irritant contact dermatitis. Uh, as you see, he mentioned two important points. Usually, you see it sparing the faults, and you see it uh, with erosions. Uh, the second common um, differential diagnosis is candidal diaper dermatitis. It is the reverse to the irritant contact. It is usually affecting the folds, as you see very clearly in this picture. And the second important point, you can see the small satellite babules here. This is highly suggestive of a candidal infection. In Bitaigo, also you can see it, but uh, it is very uh, easy to differentiate. But for, for, uh, for this candidal diaper dermatitis, of course, if you want to uh, confirm it, you can take a scale and examine it and For the Bitaigo, it will demarcate areas of erosions or well demarcated blisters, as you see in the uh, upper side. Uh, uh, usually, re, re, uh, after the blister like heal, then it will leave area of erosion, and there is uh, the patient will discover the mother or the 
care caregiver will prescribe a uh, oozing. If you want to confirm it, you can take also swab and maybe it will show the bacteria. Another uncommon uh, presentation is zinc, zinc deficiency. It is very rare. You will see uh, ulceration very oral around the mouth and ulceration in the upper area. Usually the patient also will have chronic diarrhea and will have also a lupicia or hairless. So what's the proper initial treatment uh, for patients who present with irritant contact dermatitis? This is this advice we should give it to all patients presenting with an herbal dermatitis, especially if you think it is irritant. So this is six steps. You uh, first use a, a super absorbent uh, diapers, almost what, whatever available in the, common, uh, in the market now is super absorbent. Uh, advise a frequent diaper change. Uh, eliminate, uh, eliminate irritants. So don't uh, advise them not, not to use any soaps. Just clean the area with the water only and then dry it with a towel. I use the barrier creams after each change, like zinc oxide, which I will bring a photo later on. Uh, it is available in all health centers and available in all polyclinics. Avoid also a very important point, five, point number five, avoid commercial wipes because it contains many chemicals and can irritate the area. And if it's possible to allow for uh, a diaper fail. So the treatment steps for diaper rush, reinforce, first reinforce the broader diapering hygiene I just show you. And the barrier creams that are uh, very common, I just show you, is uh, zinc olive and uh, soda cream. And if you like, there is no response in three to five days, you can add the hydrocortisone cream or amazon cream if you are suspecting a, a candida dermatitis, PID for three to five days. If no improvement in three to five days, then you have to refer him to a specialist to think of other differential diagnosis. Uh, please don't use uh, topical steroid for longer periods at this area. I know the patient will like, like would like to use uh, the, the mothers uh, would like to use uh, potent topical steroid at the area because it it will relieve the complaint in few seconds and few days. Uh, this is uh, examples of uh, a topical potent topical steroids available in the health centers. And it contained a, a, a potent uh, steroid, which is betamethasone. Uh, please never use it in the diaper area and never use it for children. Uh, we have uh, cases of Cushing uh, caused by the inappropriate use of topical steroids in the diaper area. But it's not reported. We have cases in Oman, but not reported. Uh, and uh, we have, but we have cases other, from other uh, countries uh, of exogenous uh, Cushing syndrome. Uh, in this case, we was using uh, a very important topical steroid, which is glumethasone. Uh, we know the diaper area usually the absorption is higher than the other areas due to also to uh, occlusion. So I show you the examples. Please don't use them in the diaper area. Um, till today, I'm just getting some patients using the same uh, creams, especially the last two, Candid B and Obizol B uh, from uh, GB in health centers. So here we finish diaper, uh, diaper, uh, diaper rush. We'll move to another very common, extremely common complaint, infantile seborrheic dermatitis. It is thought to be uh, due to malassezia furfur, the fungal infection, or due to uh, hormonal fluctuations. Usually it present in the, uh, commonly in the scalp as a, a blades of yellowish scales. And it can also affect the face, and it can also affect the folds of the body, usually be, uh, be behind the ears, and in the folds of the hands and uh, neck. Okay, how will you approach a patient of the infant? Uh, how you will treat a patient with infantile seborrheic dermatitis? If it is in the scalp, we call it a cradle cap. So you can uh, first reassure the patient, uh, reassure the parents, because it is a self limiting. Usually, it's solved within six to one, 12 months. Within six to 12 months, they can apply an emollient 
uh, whatever they like, like Vaseline, baby oil, or in the health centers we have liquid paraffin. Uh, they can shampoo the patient uh, with the, uh, the new need or the infant with a non-medicated baby shampoo. Uh, if in extensive cases, we may use hydrocortisone cream for one week or amiconazole cream. Uh, and it will, uh, especially if the patient is having like uh, severe itching. What about uh, infantile cerebral grammars of the body? So again, reassure, which is the same disease, usually they are resolved within six to 12 months. Uh, they can apply an emollient uh, because the, sometimes we get a maceration in the folds. We can, they can use a powder cream. Uh, we, are, we usually use meconazole cream for two weeks. You may combine it with a high, high, combine it with a hydrocortisone cream for a one week. If no improvement after two weeks, you should refer the patient to us. We think of other the differential diagnosis, like atopic, which is most commonly atopic dermatitis. All other uh, association of uh, seborrheic dermatitis, we have a, a lot of symptoms that are associated with seborrheic dermatitis. Here we finish about seborrheic dermatitis. We'll move to another common infection in infants, uh, infants or uh, children, in vitaigo. Uh, it is a highly contagious uh, infection, uh, usually seen in children between two to five years of age. Uh, it can be classified in two, two, ways, two ways, either as primary uh, or secondary, according to the mood of uh, infection. However, we, we, we like to uh, classify it clinically as a bullus or non bullus. The first photo showing uh, a non bullus in vitaigo, and the second photo is showing uh, a bullus in vitaigo. Usually, it is uh, contact, uh, transmitted by a direct contact or from so for bullus, uh, non-bullus in vitaigo, it is caused by staph aureus, sometimes caused by group A beta hemolytic step focus. Usually they present as a small vessel that will dry and will leave a honey crust, uh, honey uh, colored crust. Sometimes you may find uh, the genuinal uh, lymphadenopathy. Adenopathy. The, bull the bullus uh, form usually affects the nutrients. It is due to toxin. And as you see in the photo, it's the bus inside the bulla, and the bulla uh, looks flaccid. And it will rupture spontaneously and it will leave an area of erosion. Uh, systemic complaints sometimes may, may be there, like in weakness and fever. And How will you treat uh, non bullas in vitaigo? Local wound care and gentle cleansing. Avoid rubbing of the area so it gets as it may separate the bacterial infection. Uh, we use for simple cases, like one or two patients. Patient is completely normal, no systemic complaints. You can use even only topicals, like topical mebrosine or physiotic acid for uh, either BID or TID. Uh, or an antibiotics uh, for extensive disease or uh, if there's a school outbreaks. Bullas in vitaigo, almost the same treatment, but uh, most more, mass, vast majority of patients we use uh, a systemic antibiotic because it may break uh, the bullas uh, in vitaigo in a new unit, it may progress to staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. So, for antibiotic, we use seven day course, uh, and the child can return to school uh, 24 hours after starting the effective uh, antibiotics. Complications of embolus uh, and include uh, both subtopical dermatitis, uh, approximately 5% of the patient, and it is irrespective of whether or an antibiotic used or not. Uh, what is the dose of antibiotic? We are, what is the choice and what is the dose? We are using uh, either cephalexine or diclocicity, and you have, this is this type of form up to date, you have here the uh, doses for each one. You can revise it later. Okay, another very common uh, infection in children is a uh, fungal infection of the scalp or the hair. We call it tinea uh, It is a zoophilic uh, fungi, usually from animals. 
especially rabbits and cats, but it also can be from horses and other animals. We classify it as endothrix or ecothrix, ectothrix, uh, uh, based on the invasion of the fungi into the hair shaft. So usually it presents, as you see in the photos, as well demarcated areas of hair loose, alopecic patches, and with scaling. And if you concentrate on the area, you can see the broken hairs. We use here a wood lamp, the UV light, and it will show a uh, yellow uh, green uh, fluorescence. So this patient, uh, all of them, they will need all the fungals and need to be reviewed by a dermatologist. Usually we give terbinafine for eight to four weeks and we extend it or decrease it upon the response of the patient. Okay, Dr. Zahal, I think I speak too much. Now time for question. Question three. Uh, you have this patient, eight years old. He presented with the following skin lesion. Uh, and his father, for fun, for four months, and he had, his father has atopic dermatitis. So the the question what what vitamin mineral, uh, mineral difference uh, deficiency is responsible for this presentation? I guess for the all we'll wait for the all participant to answer. Uh, Dr. Zahal, how many responses we got? Now we're getting 90 responses. MashaAllah. 19 or 90? Na 93 now. Okay, we'll wait for a few seconds and then you can show the, the result. Oh, okay. You want 100? Okay. Ali, whatever. Okay, now we are stuck in 96, I think we we'll end it. Yes, just show it. So, very smart audience. Yes, you got it right. Uh, it is not related to any vitamin or mineral deficiency. Just waiting for the slide to come. So, 60% of you know it. it is, we call it petriasis alba. It is a very common skin complaint between the uh, eggs of 3 to 16 years. Usually, it presents as a faint, hypopigmented uh, macules and patches. Most of the time on the face are on angles of the mouth, uh, associated with a dry skin and atopic dermatitis and also with a sun exposure. It will resolve spontaneously. You just need, if there is like excessive scaling, you can uh, give an emollient or any moisturizer. If there is uh, erythema that is disturbing the patient, you can, we can give short uh, course of hydrocortisone uh, cream. Uh, it is not related to any vitamin or mineral defici uh, deficiency. Just the issue of the patient. Another very common uh, infection, fungal infection. Uh, you will notice it in adults and also in, in children. We, it is petriasis uh, versicolor. In Arabic, we call it al-khaliya uh, al It's a superficial cutaneous fungal infection common in uh, humid climates and in hot uh, seasons. It is not contagious and it's caused by the dimorphic uh, fungi malsesia. And uh, regarding presentation, the presentation it can present either as a hyperpigmented or uh, hypopigmented or arithmetous patches or macules. Usually it uh, very favors the neck and the back of the back and the chest. If you concentrate, uh, you can see uh, 
scales on the on some faint faint scales on the lesions. Uh, as it is very common, you may start treatment from the primary health care from primary health care uh, uh, center. You can use uh, use uh, first antifungal shampoo, antifungal shampoo, which is uh, either ketoconazole no, no, shampoo. No, I'm showing no. showing uh, when uh, sorry for disturbance. I'm showing two types of uh, common anti uh, antifungal shampoos available in the outside pharmacies. One is called Favu shampoo and Nizoral shampoo, both of them containing uh, nizor, uh, ketoconazole. Uh, the patient has to use it uh, at least three times if he lives active infection, three to four times uh, a week, and has to keep it at least 10 minutes on the skin and then wash it. Uh, we have other uh, shampoos like uh, selenium sulfide, uh, also called Salsan Blue, but it is not available. They can get it only online. It is not available in the outside uh, pharmacies as well. And of course, uh, uh, along with the antifungal shampoo, you can use uh, topical antifungals. Uh, either meconazole cream or clot, uh, clotrimazole cream, uh, PID for two to four weeks. If there is no response, we you are using uh, oral antifungals, uh, oral antifungals for seven days. We use itraconazole 200 milligram OD for seven days. Uh, usually, the itraconazole is very safe. Just check if the patient is having any like uh, liver disease or uh, hepatitis. If not, you you don't do you don't need to do anything you can start it like on a zone yourself if you have it in your center and those as i said 200 milligram od for seven days if the case is resistant we can you can refer to us and we use other antifungals and we check the compliance as well okay here we finish pityriasis versicolor and we do another very common complaint to primary health care uh, we have, uh, as you see in the photos, viral warts. We have different types of uh, viral warts according to the body site uh, affected, according to the type of human papilloma virus involved. So uh, we have more than 100 types of uh, human papilloma virus subtypes. Usually it's spread by skin to skin contact or by auto manipulation. The incubation period for the wild wats can last even up to two years. I guess I mentioned here 12 months, but I have patient who uh, we have patient report to uh, have uh, incubation period last, lasting 18 to 24 months. So we usually we don't know when the patient got infected. As I said, uh, the clinical features depend on the site involved. We have common wats affecting uh the hands and foods we have uh, plantar walls affecting the soles and we have plain walls and the last photo uh affecting the face you may think it other other uh, uh, other complaints like acne but you can see it is very plain, uh, flat topped uh babules we have other adults like genital walls filiform walls and bare angle walls how will you approach patient with viral wards? You, uh, we have to mention to the patient that spontaneous resolution may occur. Uh, and some, uh, like, uh, according the, to the literature, it is about, about between 30 to 50%. Uh, what can you use in the health center? You can use the topical salicylic acid. Uh, we have in the health centers, uh, if you see from the right side of the slide, uh, Clomac, which contains salicylic acid, and we have uh, also from outside pharmacies a uh, Cornex gel. It is a gel, not a cream. But this, this the topicals you cannot use it for facial or genital warts, as, it's, as it is easy to uh, difficult to apply here, and it can cause also irritation and uh, it can cause uh, pigmentation. Also, you cannot use it in pregnancy. So, if you have patient with facial genital warts. Uh, or warts in pregnancy, you, can, you have to refer them to us, but other warts and other parts of the body, uh, 
like if there's no response after, uh, after eight weeks, I guess uh, I'm stressing on this point, the topical salicylic acid has need, needs uh, uh, time to walk. Don't give it for one week and then you see the patient is not responding. I, I give the, the topicals for at least one to two months and then if there's no response, we, we use other treatment which is cryotherapy or liquid nitrogen. Now we'll move to a most common disorder affecting adults, acne vulgaris. I'm sure you are getting patients with acne in the primary health care. So, uh, you know, for acne, we have four main pathogenic factors, like obstructing the accumulation of bacteria, probinobacterium, and then inflammation and uh, obstruction of the, by the keratin of the hair follicle. What are the risk factors? This is very important. The most important uh, risk factor is familial tendency. Other risks include hormonal disorders like polycystic ovarian syndrome, drugs, especially steroids and anticonvulsants. And uh, recently, we are getting patients due to makeups and application of exclusive and, and oily cosmetics. So almost all patients who come to me, I check all their cosmetics. Sometimes, some cases, I just stop some cosmetics and then all acne uh, improve. What about an acne? It is a very controversial uh, association. According to uh, recent literature uh, or evidence, they say a high glycemic diet or sugary diet or dairy product, especially milk, may be associated with excessive effect. Sometimes uh, I ask if the patient is also not responding. I, I will, I'll ask the patient to check if um, to observe himself or herself if there is an exacerbation of, of acne related to any diet to, to stop it. So we divide the, the clinical presentation of acne into two or three types, either mild, moderate, and severe. Mild, usually you will see small, small, very few papules, as metaspapules, and you will see mainly comedones, either white or black. The second moderate type, you will see a little bit more papules, and you will see uh, pustules. And the severe part, usually they will have many papules and pustules, and then you will see the big nodules and acne cysts, and you may see also early scarring. So for each, for each uh, type, we are using a different uh, treatment. But first, first before we go to treatment, there is a general recommendation or advices. So if, if there is a uh, female patient having like irregular period, she is having hirsutism, you may screen for hormonal disorders indicated. And the uh, labs, uh, you mentioned them, it's, it's according to the patient, I will not I don't, uh, you don't just stick to these investigations it's according to the patient complaint. Also, you may advise the low glycemic diet and to avoid milk, avoid oily and greasy cosmetics, avoid uh, picking of the pimples, as this may cause uh, uh, a post inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which is very difficult to treat. Also, avoid herbals. Most of them they contain uh, like chemicals or natural products that can may, contact, may cause contact dermatitis. And then we have a very big issue now with Instagram. All patients are seeking treatment from Instagram. Most of the creams are not uh, evaluated. Most of them they contain uh, topical steroids. So to avoid any herbals and any other creams. So how we treat the mild cases, we, are, we usually use uh, topicals either according to the patient, either use the benzyl peroxide, I'm showing the process here, or a retinoid, uh, like retinoid, or a combination of the two, uh, benzyl peroxide with a creatine uh, and adelacine uh, or a clindamycin lotion with benzyl peroxide. A creatine or retinoid, usually we use it if the patient is having comedones. Then uh, the moderate and severe cases usually done by us. Uh, so 
we may use um, that on the moderate uh, acne we use all antibiotic with topicals the same topicals as in the mild case and then in the severe cases we use oral uh, isoprenoin i will not go in details because this needs uh, needs time to discuss it just uh, uh, one disease before uh, before we go to covid and uh, and uh, continuous manifestations of uh, COVID-19. Uh, atopic dermatitis, I'm, I'm sure all of you know it, or it's called uh, atopic eczema. It's a chronic inflammatory skin uh, disease, unknown origin. Usually there is a family history, and we have the, something called the atopic triad, uh, the association of atopic dermatitis with allergic rhinitis and uh, atopic uh, asthma. These patients are prone to get bacteria and uh, anaphylactic reactions to food. Little bit increased uh, with increased frequency. So that's the usually that is a chronic or lapsing uh, condition. Bruritis, almost 99% of the patients they have it, and most patients have personal or family history of uh, atopy or uh, allergy. What is, what, what, what is the primary findings you will see in examination? Usually it is affecting the flexors, so we'll discuss the uh, distribution later on in a few seconds. So we will have xerosis or dryness. You will see electrifications due to uh, scratching uh, along with the eczematous lesions. Sometimes you will see uh, crusting in some, uh, as you see in the second photo, some crusting in the some uh, lesions. If, you, if there is uh, like uh, the, the lesions are wet and then the, the mother is describing a discharge, please take swab from that. They usually get super added bacterial infections, especially staph aureus and also MRSA. So the distribution is usually different between uh, infants. Usually it's affecting the extensors, as you see in the photo. And then in the adult and children, usually affecting the flexors. And in the child, children usually uh, over uh, the face. So, what uh, uh, general advices you should give to a patient with atopic dermatitis or a, or, or a balance of a patient with, with uh, uh, atopic dermatitis? They should apply uh, moisturizers liberally. I guess mentioned here twice a day, but it should be more than that. If there is any triggers, either food, dust, whatever, they should avoid it. Then the bath should be shorter and it should be with the uh, warm water, not a hot water. And whatever they use, it should be non fragrance. And uh, whatever the cleanser they are using, it should be also moisturizing. Don't use like potent cleansers like Detol and Lifebuoy. Uh, avoid scratching and to keep the uh, nails of the patient trimmed. So uh, if the uh, nails are long, they can cause uh, skin injury and then increase the risk of infection. Uh, then the, the clothes should be cotton. And then they may use also humidifier in the body. This will keep, keep uh, will help in keeping the patient most of. So how we approach a patient? Uh, first, uh, after the assessment, we give the general advice, patient, the education of the balance, the advices I, I gave before, and then we give emollients uh, liberally and free, even whatever, whatever the frequency they can uh, apply. If there is acute flare up, we, we have to use uh, typical steroids and we have to rule out any secondary infection, as I said to you. Uh, if after the resolution of the acute exacerbation, if there is still few lesions, we may shift the patient to um, steroidal uh, topicals like uh, protopic ointment. This is usually done by us. So uh, I'm just uh, mentioning here the first steps and the non pharmacological advices that you should give to the patient. Uh, please, uh, I didn't bring the table here, but you have to know the table of uh, classes of the topical steroids, which one to use in pediatric and which one to use in adults. 
I think in uh, most of the health centers you have only alpha coat and bitnovate. Alpha coat usually we use it in children and bitnovate, please don't use it over the face or genitalia. Use it for the body of adults. What about emollient? Emollient shoes. There's a vast, uh, vast majority of emollients in the market. Whatever it is okay with the patient, they can use it. If they are trying, to, if they are choosing any emollient, choosing any emollient, they should should be in front. And for example, fasolin should be 100% pure and with no fragrance. And just giving you photos of the one examples of the best uh, emollients in the market. Okay, just before we go to COVID, we'll discuss about uh, some small, uh, some three, three uh, common complaints in patients with diabetes, uh, skin complaints in patients with diabetes. So we have this patient, 49 years old, he's diabetic male, and he has a four month history of scaling and maceration between the toes. You see the clinical photo in the left, and then in the right, you are applying a wood slide, a UV light, and you see uh, a red fluorescence. The question is, what is your diagnosis? I'm just checking whatever you wrote in there. There's one question here about doxycycline. You can use it, uh, we use 100 milligram OD for three to six months. Even lesser than that, uh, lesser than that if the patient responded. Uh, well, there is someone answered. Dr. Zahar, how many responses we got? Now we got 100. I'm launching the result now. So this is a very difficult case, actually. I just brought, you, I brought it to you uh, to emphasize that not any lesion between the legs and diabetics is a tinea bitis. So the diagnosis here is, is erythroplasma. Usually in tinea pedis, we don't see a red fluorescence. If there is fluorescence, you will see it as a green or yellow. Uh, if there is. If there is a red fluorescence, this is bacterial infection. Uh, we call it erythroplasma. It can present in interdigital as tinea pedis. Uh, so let us discuss about tinea pedis a little bit. So, uh, the first, uh, first information is that you have to know that tinea pedis is, we have three clinical variants. The most common variant is the first photo, which is the interdigital uh, variant. Uh, the others, we have mucosin and the bullous type. The mucosin usually they, they have having like a diffuse scaling of the soles and uh, on one hand. We call it the two foot one hand uh, syndrome. The bullous variant, they usually have uh, itching and, and uh, acute blisters over the foot. We'll discuss about the interdigital inter variant as it is the most common type. So, is it, it is the most common type, as I said. Usually, it presents as erythema or scaling and maceration in the wood spaces. Somehow, you can see the lesions like, like appearing like wet. And prolitis is very common. And as I said, if you do fluorescence, sometimes you may see the, the yellow uh, fluorescence under the wood side. How will you approach a patient with tinea pedis? First important and the, the only important, yani very important step is proper hygiene. They should keep the area dry. Uh, they should use uh, cotton uh, gloves, uh, a non-occlusive non sh uh, shoes. Uh, and what if they are using uh, uh, gla uh, socks, uh, not gloves, socks, it should be not wet and they should clean it on a daily basis. And uh, the second step is to prescribe a topical infantifungal BID for two to four weeks. You have either a cream, 
it is only clotrimazole. It is not obezole B. It is obezole cream. And or at, uh, clotri at clotrimazole lotion. It is also available in the centers under the name of, uh, uh, I think, meconazole tincture. It is tincture, which means lotion. So you can use it for two to four weeks along with the uh, emphasis on the proper hygiene. If there is no, no response, you can use oral antifungals. Uh, we are usually, usually using uh, turbinacin, 250 milligram OD for uh, seven to two weeks, seven days to uh, 14 days. Sometimes uh, this patient, they get uh, super added bacterial infection. We will see maybe crust or pustules. Uh, so if you think of a bacterial infection, you may use topical, uh, topical antibiotic like fusidine cream. Or if, it, if the infection is extensive, you can use even oral antibiotic. Uh, oral antibiotic. If there is a system case, uh, please refer the patient to dermatology clinic so we can like uh, rule out other, uh, other differentials. Okay, another common uh, complaint in uh, patients with diabetes, uh, the pigmentation, uh, filvety pigmentation over the, uh, over the neck, or over the flexors, uh, like axilla. Uh, this is due to, usually associated with the insulin resistance. It has many, many associations. But I'm just mentioning here that it's associated with uh, insulin resistance. It's also associated with the uh, gastric cancer or GI adenocarcinoma. So usually we evaluate the patient based on the symptoms and uh, the signs associated with it. If it's, he has only diabetes and, um, and uh, insulin type, insulin resistance, we just, uh, we don't do any further evaluation. So treatment, if he is obese, you should also associate with, uh, with obesity. If he is obese, you can advise weight reduction. If there is any underlying condition, you can use, uh, uh, you can treat that uh, infection. Uh, we have uh, for cosmetic uh, uh, treatment, we can use some creams. Like we have uh, the most cream for it is 39 cream. Some patients who are concerned about it, I uh, sometimes I I use it, uh, but it needs like uh, a strict a strict uh, advice on how to use it in, this, in the neck as it causes uh, irritation in most of the patients. Another very common complaint is skin tax. It is a very common uh, asymptomatic complaint. Also, uh, also in uh, patients who are obese and, and patients with diabetes. It presents as, as a soft pedunculated babules on the neck and uh, even also in the friction areas like axilla or on the groin. So treatment, it is a cosmetic issue. We don't uh, offer, uh, this time we don't offer any treatment in the dermatology clinics. Unless the patient has irritated skin tag or affected skin tag, at that time we interfere. We usually cut it with a scissor or we use electrocautery as you see in the second photo. Okay, we finish. Uh, I'll just uh, discuss briefly about the cutaneous manifestation of COVID-19. So, about the cutaneous manifestations of this new emerging uh, pandemic, uh, whatever available data is only a case series. We have small few uh, uh, few uh, case series, a few uh, systematic reviews about the, the cutaneous manifestation of it. It is, very, it is very important to mention two points here. There is no clear association, association between skin manifestations and the severity of the disease till now. We are waiting for the further studies to come. And it's also to mention that some skin findings may represent actually a cutaneous reaction to the treatment used. It's not uh, due to the virus itself, which is maybe a drug reaction or a reaction to any other uh, medication use. So we have this recent uh, systematic review in the European Journal of Dermatology. 
Uh, they studied 507 patients. And uh, usually the cutaneous manifestations appeared nine days after the uh, starting of the COVID-19 symptoms. Only 13 pa pa patients, they had their skin lesions started as a phallus symptoms. What was the uh, skin complaints? Most of the patients had erythema, almost 45% plus, uh, percent of the patients. And they have something called chill pain or uh, burn you, or, which is called now the COVID toes. It is painful babules, erythematous babules in the toes. I will just show a photo in a few seconds. We have particular like lesions also. We have physical uh, eruption, we have libido and necrosis, and we have petechia in some patients. This is uh, uncommon representations. So, this is the photos of the common manifestations of COVID 19. So, the first photo showing the articardial loss. Uh, as you see, azimatous patches and uh, macules, some, so if you concentrate some of them clinically to the patient, you can see the edematous uh, wheels. Erythema in the second photo, second photo B. And here, see, you see the most uh, the common uh, presentation, a common presentation called now the COVID-2. It is painful uh, babules over the toes. Uh, we call it a chill plane like lesions or a pelnia. Uh, here, this is a uh, example that is not uh, very clear. And then here we have the barbora non blanching uh, skin lesions. And then we have here the net like uh, non blanching skin lesions, levido uh, reticular like uh, uh, lesions that is usually we see it in uh, connective tissue disorders and we see it in uh, like a cell and patient with vascular disorders as well. So another recent study in July 2017, and this is a review, a systematic review as well, for 1716 70, patients. They studied patients who have patient who are confirmed with COVID or suspected to have COVID. They noticed in this systematic review that Bernio is uh, in, uh, noted in the mild disease, while little form of barbara was seen in the patient with critically ill patients. What about the result of the whole patient? They noticed the mobile form of erythema in 22% of the patients. Bernie like was they noticed in 18 patients, articulia and 16 macular erythema and vesicular, vesicular and other uh, non common uh, cutaneous manifestations like bubbles, comamus, and little form barbara. So they uh, grade the, according to severity, they grade the cutaneous manifestation. As we said here, the bilnu was associated with the mild cases. Moderate to severe cases were associated with the others like vesicular erythema and multiple form rash. The patient uh, with the reform barbora, which is like star-like uh, barbora or uh, with ulceration, this, they noticed it almost in 100% of the hospitalized, uh, all, all patients were hospitalized. So this patient, um, most of them, they were admitted to the ICU. As I said, till now, we're still, it is not confirmed. We don't know the clear association between the severity of the disease and the cutaneous manifestation. What about Oman? We have, we're still lagging behind. We don't have any evidence. Uh, we don't have any study of what this cutaneous manifestation in our patient, but we have this uh, small study in uh, Anahara and in Royal Hospital. They studied 63 person, 63 adult patient, and they found the body rash. They didn't, they didn't mention about the type of the rash. Uh, they didn't mention about the uh, duration, how, how, how many days it appeared after the symptoms. So uh, they found it in three percent of the patient, but we don't know what body rash they mentioned. It is not mentioned in the in the article. So I think I took uh, one hour and a quarter minutes. Thank you for uh, being here with us. I I hope the presentation was beneficial to you, and I see some questions here. Uh, I don't know if Zahra should answer them or what. Thank you, Dr. Al-Mu'tasim, for a nice presentation.
and updating us in uh, about the skin uh, manifestation in uh, primary health care. So we'll go through some question and we need your uh, advice in short. The first question, uh, can hands, words, separate to genitalia by skin to skin contact? Uh, well, this is still uh, uh, not confirmed because we know the type of HPV causing uh, skin warts in the, in the hands is different from skin warts and the human papilloma virus causing the genital warts. Uh -huh. But can it happen uh, uh, theoretically speaking? We don't know. Maybe it can happen, but according to what evidence we know, it should not because we have other human papilloma virus which is 6 and 11 causing the genital warts. And when we, we have in the Hands, we have the common warts and the plain warts, which is caused by HPV 1, 3, and 10. So it should so no, not so, be there. So, so no evidence uh, for, for No, so, no for evidence so of, no, of that. No evidence of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question. Why in patients with hemangioma, uh, Indiral is prescribed? Uh, Indiral is probanol. 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 Why we are prescribing yeah. Probanol for hemangioma? Yeah, propanol has been show, uh, shown uh, to be effective in uh, in uh, hemangiomas. Uh, the postulation is that it, because it, in the, it causes uh, vasoconstriction. A vasoconstriction then it causes improvement of the hemangioma. As you know, it is a vascular tumor. For this how is, the, it is still, For still the pathogenesis is uh, the mechanism of action of propanol is not fully understood, but it is thought to be due to this. Uh, uh, this information I mentioned due to vasoconstriction. Thank you. Uh, another question about the acne. If a lady get a pregnant and she's was on uh, uh, what should be done for her? Uh, yeah. when, mm -hmm. So uh, isotetanoin first. It is a category X. It yeah. is. Uh, uh, it so, is proven to cause uh, teratogenicity. Uh, what should be done? Yeah. Uh, for me, if, if for me, if it is like an early stage, I think uh, we usually we usually for, for such patient we usually follow them to the gynae and then we reach we reach a, a final plan. But most of the patient, after like you explain to them, most of them they will go to abortion. Okay, yeah. and uh, there is a question, why most of oral drugs that used in treatment of acne contraindicated in pregnancy? Not most of them. Uh, so what if, uh, let me discuss what can you use in pregnancy. You can use clindamycin lotion, it's category B. Benzyl peroxide, although it's category C, you can use it. Uh, orally, what can you can use also another cream called, and I didn't mention it in my lecture, it's called azelic, azelic cream or skinorine, is available with the name commonly with the name skinorine. It can you also, it is category B, you can use it. What, what about orally? Orally, you can use erythromycin, it is category B. Also, you can use it if it is very severe. This okay. is the medication we use in pregnancy. In the another... cream is category C. Uh, but uh, I don't advise to be used in pregnancy because we have alternatives for it. But uh, orally, we can. You, you don't use uh, toxic, and we don't use uh, isotretinoin. I think we need to uh, give another uh, session about the acne. Uh, another question about the uh, treatment. What is the, the treatment recommended for nine years old child with acne? Well, first of all, for me, I will uh, evaluate the patient. He okay. should not get agony at that, that, that at this stage. Did he apply anything occlusive or uh, if he has any other, other signs of a hormonal disturbance? So I will evaluate the patient. And then you treat him as, as any patient, uh, any adult patient. So if you see comedones, you can use tetanoin cream at this stage. There is no, nothing we are afraid of. And if you see like inflammatory barbules and or pustules, you can use the topical antibiotics like benzyl peroxide or clindamycin. So you treat him as adult. Uh, don't worry about the age, but you just check what is the cost. Okay.
Uh, doctor, it is advisable to start steroid with antiviral in herpes, zero, in herpes zoster? No. Steroid. Uh, but, but steroid can we in herpes use zoster? Any? Even, even in patients with um, ophthalmic herpes, we don't know the current evidence showing that steroids had, has no rule. So we are usually giving, for herpes zoster, we're using the all antivirals, we are using analgesics, good analgesics. And if the patient has uh, itching, you can use, give TD. Other than that, don't use any other uh, oral medication. Okay. Topically, uh, sometimes topically we are giving. Uh, topically, sometimes we are giving uh, a topical antibiotic to treat any super added bacterial infection or uh, as a prophylaxis. Uh, Victor, how you can differentiate between skin tag and warts? Uh, as you, as I, I showed in the photo, uh, let me see. As I saw in the photo, the usual warts are like thin created lesions. You see the big lesion and then the base is a little bit narrower. And it is very soft. The wart yeah. usually they have the base is, is, is wider. And then the surface usually it is for locus. So you see it like uh, dipping, like a small uh, beam pointing. Or, or we call it for locus. Okay. So this is the main uh, difference. Uh, and then you have, of course, you will see the patient is obese in skin tags, you see it in the areas and the neck, and you may notice also a cancer is negative cancer. More, more, exposure, more exposure, more experience, you will be more confident with the uh, with skin tag or, uh, or uh, what? I think uh, the exposure is important to, yes. to see more cases. Uh, there is a question. Can you recommend a good uh, term, uh, dermatologic textbook for prime health care level? Uh, I think I can, I can send it to Dr. Zaha later on WhatsApp and then he share it in your uh, groups. Okay. I, uh, we have one called ABC of dermatology. Uh, mm -hmm. And I have another one, uh, general dermatology. I can send it to Dr. Zaha later on and then he can share it to you. Tamam, Doctor. If is uh, another question, do we have to refer nail pitting without other skin manifestation? No. Nail pitting is very common uh, if there is nothing uh, associated with it. Uh, you don't have to just reassure the patient. It is most of the time either idiopathic or familiar. Myself, I have uh, nail pitting. I don't have anything. So, uh, so but it is associated with uh, psoriasis and it's associated with uh, alopecia areata. So we have to go through the history and differential diagnosis before referring yeah. to the, with the patient. And, and, yes. Uh, what is the uh, What is the safety, what is the safety of topical steroid in the first trimester for cases of dermatitis? It in is category C. Typical it is category C. C. We are using. We are using them. We are using them. Okay. Even all the steroids we are using in pregnancy if it is needed. Uh, uh, then, doctor, where do you prefer to treat mild to moderate acne to be treated in primary health care or in uh, dermatological skin clinic? Mild cases, I guess, should you can treat it uh, in the uh, primary health care after the evaluation of the patient. Don't treat it and then you have the patient is having hormonal disease or is applying or is having a, a, a wrong skin care. So evaluate the patient, uh, exclude all uh, the causes I just mentioned. And then if he is okay, then you can start the topical treatment yourself. Within one or two months, there is no response. You can refer to the local dermatology clinic. Some uh, some health centers they have doxycycline and they are using. I get a response from some family family physicians. They are using doxycycline. If you want to use it, it is OD after 100 milligram OD after food. Uh, you can mm -hmm. start it with, within for two months and then review the patient. If there is no oh. response in two months and then you can refer. If there is a response, then you can continue the treatment up to four to six months. Okay. 
So we have to stop the medication and to and follow up and then we'll reassess if he needs uh, yes. to be to continue in a, in a heart center or to be referred to dermatological clinic. Yes. Nice. Uh, there is the last question. Have you seen any of these COVID-19 skin manifestation in patient here in Oman, especially in Bahla? I didn't see any COVID patient, to be honest. So I <laughs> having, I'm working in a bowling clinic, so all the patients, they go to the hospital. So I didn't uh, see any patient. Okay. Uh, Dr. Zahar, do you have any comment? Uh, thank you, Dr. Walid, uh, for your, uh, I mean, sharing the session. And uh, there are some questions about the, if we can share the slides, uh, get permission from Dr. al -Muhtasim. I have some questions, uh, questions here, like, like, let me just uh, read them. Uh, here, name, I'm on. I don't know what. Is local steroid for Nabi Rush a new update in less than one year child previously was not recommended? No, you can use it in less than one year. But before we had Alpha Court, the generic name Alpha Court, and then they changed it to another company. That company, they mentioned it in the, in the leaflet, they mentioned it should not be used less than 10 years. So now, if you prescribe a hydrocortisone for for uh, less than 10 years of age, the pharmacy will give alpha code. They will not give the other uh, Jordanian company we are having in the pharmacy. So you still can use it less than one year. And there's, there's a question from Khawla al -Huti. Is doxycycline safe for adolescent? I have seen patients with acute hemolysis. Uh, for me, it is very safe. I did not see any patient with uh, acute hemolysis. Uh, maybe you're, you're Referring to another antibiotic, I don't know, but I'm starting doxycycline almost every day for all patients. They didn't. The most common complaint is gastritis or diarrhea. Diarrhea, like I complained, but I didn't get any patient with acute hemolysis. And then there is another infection. Another, another question here from anonymous attendee. Which cause more effective? Two weeks, it's like a or seven days, as mentioned, uh, for what you are referring for what infection. When we can label patient is it like a resistant? This is the depends on your uh, on your uh, on which fungal infection you are referring because the dose is different and the duration is different. Uh, for usually, for example, for T bacteriosis versicolor, we give for seven days. If there is no response uh, within one month, and then we give uh, another uh, or an antifungal, we give fluconazole. Uh, uh, four minutes uh, left for the session. If you can answer a few questions before we wrap up, we can choose them. Is this a look, Doctor? What is the role of steroid in burn cases at level of private health care? Steroid depends. If you are mentioned, if you 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 mean a sun term, then you have you can use uh, steroid. You have to use steroid. But if you are thinking of like heat burn or water burn, whatever other types of burns, then we don't use uh, typical steroids. We yes, according to the level of the burn. Is it primary? Is if it is like a first degree burn, it needs only uh, uh, like a, uh, what we call it the skin repair creams, skin repair creams like Mebo, or you can use the topical antibiotic, uh, 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 sulfur, uh, sulfur diazine or flamazine cream, plus the wound care. The other cases of burn, the second degree and third degree, you have to refer them to plastic surgery. It's not a dermatological uh, uh, disease. Can we have the slides, please? Yes, you can, sure. I will send it to Dr. Zahar, I can share it with you. What yeah. can we offer newborn with erythema toxic immunotorum? You can no need to offer them anything. If, if sometimes if they are the parents sit and they want to use something, you can give just skin cream, but I don't use anything. They, it's usually resolved in one to two weeks. Dose and duration to treat cutaneous larva migraines. Uh, patients should be referred. No, you can uh, give albendazole 300 milligram for three days. So, 
so yes that it can't let me cream be used in face and neck Uh, Lamazine, yes, you can, you can use it. Only thing is check the G6PD uh, uh, status of the patient. Even though we use it, we used it for a patient with G6PD and nothing happened. But this is mentioned as a precaution. Okay, patient with acne and high testosterone. Do we expect any response to rocutane? Yes, you can. Usually, the high testosterone depends on the level, uh, how much it is raised. Uh, a good number of patients, they have it actually familial, familial high testosterone. They will have also some localized health, uh, health autism, especially in the face. Uh, such patients, usually, I, I start hormonal treatment, either uh, the Uh, and uh, anti-androgen treatment like spinal actor, uh, uh, for example. Uh, if there is no response, I can do isotretin. You can use isotretin. There is no contraindication. But we we, we like to use the anti-androgen, especially the spinal actor. So such patients you will refer to us. We we, we will treat. So. Okay, doctor. Okay, let's check on the chat. Is there any questions? Someone here mentioned how to treat Kerion. He he, he wrote Merion, but he he meets Kerion and Fevers. Uh, this is this types of uh, inflammatory uh, tinea uh, cavities. This you should refer to us. Usually, they will come with a swelling along with the alopecia and and the hair loss. I mean, a scaling. They will get boggy swellings of other scar. They will get crust also on the area. So we use oral antifungals, we use uh, oral steroids, and we use oral and, uh, antibiotic according to the patients. So this we should treat it ourselves. So please refer to us. There is no specific, it is someone here also mentioning about the duration of topical treatment. It is according to the patient. There is no maximum duration and there is no like short, short duration, whatever the, um, The patient responded to, you can use. You can go according to the um, response of your patient. Okay, Victor. Someone here uh, mentioned what is the relation between adenocarcinoma and gay cancer and gay adenocarcinoma. Uh, it is uh, found that some patients with adenocarcinoma and gay cancer, they have. Uh, Other symptoms like weight loss and so on, and with the evaluation they found to have uh, uh, gastric carcinoma. Uh, I don't remember now the percentage, but it is not that much. Just keep it in mind. Any patient presented with a cancer, the cancer is negligent. You check the symptoms, any constitutional symptoms like weight loss, uh, lith um, lethargy, and. Uh, other uh, loss of appetite and other symptoms. We have uh, admitted Dr. Mizar. Uh, we have admitted one young girl with impaired renal function, creatinine 300 micromol. She was on doxycycline for acne for more than one month. How to prevent it? According to the literature, uh, doxycycline is uh, uh, the least antibiotic from its group to cause uh, renal dysfunction or le uh, renal impairment. For me, uh, I don't know your doctor is from which uh, from which hospital. For me, I didn't, I didn't get any patient to, with uh, impaired renal function due to doxycycline. You may check whether it is due to doxycycline or not. But, uh, but as uh, evidence, the doxycycline is the list from its group to cause renal uh, dysfunction. And for me, as from my experience, I didn't get any patients. And we don't, uh, 
we don't uh, do uh, LFT before we start the patient with doxycycline. We just ask if there's any familial kidney disorders and so on. Thank you, Dr. Mokassim. I think you can uh, ask one more question uh, from the 13 available questions because of the limit of time. And uh, the questions are coming up there. Uh, what do you think about Mebo cream? Mebo cream is very good. It's uh, good good for uh, irritation and good for uh, first degree burns. So if you have irritation, like for example, post sun exposure redness, you have irritation because of a cosmetic uh, procedure like dermabane, dermabane, lasers also, you can use uh, Mebo cream. It is very good. Doctor, how to differentiate between intertrigo and uh, sephoric dermatitis in faults in children? Uh, this is very difficult actually to uh, uh, to differentiate. So uh, intertrigo usually is affecting the faults. So sephoric dermatitis, maybe you will find the patient is having another lesions on the scalp or on the face. So this is one. But when we come into the faults, uh, intertrigo uh, usually it may cause the maceration, at, but also sephoric dermatitis it can cause uh, maceration. Sometimes there is like um, what you call it. There is like uh, both of them are bearing on the same patient. So it is you most of the cases just treat it uh, for both. So if you are thinking of sephoric dermatitis in the first, use mechanism cream to treat uh, the both of them. Uh, but sephoric dermatitis, suppose not if you like uh, do scraping and you find fungal, it's more of intertrigo, candida intertrigo. Uh, sephoric dermatitis, usually you don't see anything in the crotch. But as I said, it is very difficult to differentiate. Intertrigo is also common in children. So there is like interception between the two uh, diseases. But as I said, uh, sephoric dermatitis, uh, you can find the other uh, clues, which is uh, the scalp, scaly scalp and scaling of the other things. Okay, another question. What is the difference? How you can differentiate between psoriasis and dermatitis uh, herpet, uh, herpetus formis? Actually, the, dif uh, the difference is fairly clear clinically. I don't know if you know dermatitis herpetus formis, uh, DH. Uh, DH usually present with the physicals, and uh, yes, it, uh, it, 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 it uh, affect the extensors as I, I, uh, like uh, psoriasis, but usually present with the physicals, and it has a very severe itching. Plus, you can find the other symptoms like inflammatory bowel disease or or uh, celiac disease. Psoriasis usually will demarcate big blacks. Uh, with a thick scaling. You don't see physicals. You will see the silvery thick scaling. It also affects the scalp. So uh, the DH does not affect scalp. And it also affects the nails. And it affects the joints. This so, uh, DH does not affect the joint or does not affect the nails. So the, actually the primary skin lesions can make a difference. Although both of them affect the extensors. So how how to treat the bullous form of uh, tinea pedis uh, on the soul? Uh, the same treatment, but some this most of this patient they need uh, oral antifungal. And just check the uh, text well, make sure there is no bacterial infection, uh, super added bacterial infection. So treat it with oral, oral antifungal and, and make sure uh, there is no bacterial infection. Someone here mentioning is amniotic dermatitis. I don't know what you mean. I never came across this term or this dermatitis. دكتور المعتصم نشكرك جزيل الشكر على هذا المحاضرة القيمة. Thanks دكتور المعتصم for this nice presentation, nice color of the dermatological skin manifestation. 
ثانكس تو دكتور زاهر ان ثانكس تو دكتور احمد البوسعيدي هو از لوكينج فور ذا كويستشن از ا مانيجر ثانكس تو اول بارتيسنت هو از شيرينج وذ اس ذس تايمينج فور اراوند 1 اور اند 30 مينيتس ناو ذا سبيك تو دكتور زاهر اند دكتور معتصم Thank you, Dr. Uh, Al-Walid. Uh, uh, for that, some people they ask, they are asking about the slides. We are going to send it uh, to your email. And the live, uh, there's a live record already there. And inshallah, we'll arrange also to send the link to your email after editing uh, issues. And uh, any final message from Dr. Uh, Al-Mu'tasim? No, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zahal, Dr. Wali, for arranging this webinar. And thank you to Oman Family Medic, uh, Medicine Society. Okay. And thank you to the whole audience as well. Man and <laughs> the, the activity is more fruitful by the audience participating on the poll itself. And they are very quick, mashallah. And it, it gives us life on the presentation. And inshallah, I hope you uh, Eid Mubarak, uh, enjoy your duties and enjoy also your family life, Shua, Mishakik, and uh, be away from the burns uh, because we need to get your hands and face and body, and inshallah, uh, dermatologically, I mean, safe. Thank you all, and uh, inshallah, we are going to send uh, some of the activities in the Oman Family Medicine Society for the future activities and uh, see you soon and good night to all thank you all good night bye bye